Has Christianity always been one of the religions in the world to you? Oh, hallelujah. Christianity is not a religion. Neither is it a joining of a church and doing the Christian things like praying and giving and so on. Hallelujah. Christianity is the outworking of God's own kind of life received into the spirit of a man. Whoa. This divine life in the heart of a man makes him righteous, keeps him healthy, divinely guarded in life, prosperous and victorious. It gives you the ability to enjoy intimate fellowship with the Father and have dominion on this earth. Hallelujah. This is what awaits you if you will wholeheartedly believe that Jesus is the Son of God raised from the dead and personally confess him as the Lord of your life. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Join Dr. David Binder on the Good Life Devotion every Monday to Friday on this channel and receive truth that will usher you into exhibiting the divine life. Kindly note that you can enjoy the Good Life Devotion on these other platforms at their stated times. Do choose the most convenient one for you or switch to another in case of a broadcast challenge with your usual platform. By all means, don't miss the Good Life Devotion any day. Now, welcome to today's episode with Dr. David Bindon. Wow, 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 wow. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I am excited and I believe you are also because once again, our Father, out of his love and glorious mercy and grace, has said a meal of his word. Remember he said, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to deliver to you your inheritance in Christ. It's such a joy once again to be with you in this household of God as we feast in God's word. If today is your first time, you are welcome to today's episode. And this is the Good Life Devotion, a daily devotional teaching of the truth of God's word that the Lord Almighty has brought to this generation at this time to do so much in our life, bring us so much truth and transform the face of the earth. Topmost among them is to give you kingdom nuggets that will cause you to know truth that will bring you liberty in spirit, in soul and body and to your whole world. Cause you to enjoy real life in Christ. That's why we call it the Good Life Devotion. Secondly, the teachings are mature teachings which are needed. No, every species has milk, semi-solid food, solid food, bones, and all that. In the kingdom, it is the same. The Bible said that as babes desire the sincere milk of the word. Later in Hebrews, he said, move from elementary food and go to solid ones. The Gula devotion is a trusted source of mature teachings of God's word. What is the aim? To bring the whole body of Christ in the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to the perfect man, or to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This is God's goal. That all of us will grow and become the glorious church without spot or wrinkle. How is that going to happen? By the washing and cleansing by the word, the matured word. That's what he has sent us to do. Then also, as we do eat and feast along these lines, we are becoming more effective in the work of the ministry and the denominations in which we are so that we can not only minister to ourselves but we also minister to the world and bring many more into God's plan for their life. This week we have been dealing with the subject of um, our divinity in Christ and how we can grow to work in its fullness. And just the past episode we took a look at the truth that anyone who is in Christ is divine. Centuries ago these things were said by the church fathers. Many of them were considered heretic because people just couldn't fathom that uh, they could be sharing the same nature with the proper God. Of course, we understand from the perspective of we are sinners, we are sinners, we don't deserve, we don't deserve. It's always challenging to bring you close. Have you realized that sometimes some people feel so unqualified that you are bringing them into a greater life and they feel that life is not possible? That's how human beings have felt. God has so lifted humanity in Christ that it's, it's mind-boggling for them to conceive that God can so raise us. Imagine, he, he killed the human race in him, buried it, rose again with it, and ascended to the right hand of the majesty on high with, with the human race. And that's where you are sitting if you are in Christ. But how many can catch this? 
Yet God ordained that we will come there. That's why he has sent us your way. As we keep teaching and teaching and teaching, the light is growing brother, and many will appreciate it because it is the work of the Holy Spirit. So you are divine. You need to know that. Why? Because there was once a human in you born by your mom and dad. But when you believe that Jesus is the Christ, you got born of God. When you received Christ, you became a son of God. A being that is no more born by, because of flesh, by blood, or by the will of man, but a being that came into existence by the birth of God. If you missed that episode, kindly go back after today and watch it for detail. Today we're going to move forward, and our topic today is embrace your divinity. So if you understood yesterday that you are divine, God is calling on you to embrace your divinity. Don't throw your divinity away. I have seen a lot of people who are very proud of their tribes, who are very proud of their countries, very proud of their nations, very proud of their continents, proud of their even old schools. So proud. They've embraced that they are students from this school. They've embraced that they are people of this tribe. But sons of God have not embraced their tribe. They have not embraced their divinity. They have not embraced their nationality in Christ. Of course, Remember, we are not saying that you reject your physical tribe and all that. You still relate with them as you can relate with any human. But know your primary identity and embrace it. That's what the Lord wants to lead us into today. Father, we celebrate you for bringing us to Thank you for waking us up to the truth that we must embrace our divinity for this is our primary nature in life now. We thank you for much more that is happening in our life beyond the hearing, the watching. And the reading of these words. Thank you for grace and virtue that are changing lives everywhere in this broadcast. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Wow. Embrace your divinity. John chapter 10 verse 30 is our main scripture for today. One of the short verses in the scriptures. It says, I and my father are one. <laughs> He didn't say I and someone else are one. He says, I and my father are one. Praise God. I love this. All right, let's go through what we have in the Emancipator. I told you this is the daily devotion now from where we are teaching you the Emancipator. It comes in monthly models. Ensure that you call us to place your orders for monthly copies. Or just go to our website every month and download a free sub copy in English or French and share with other people. The first thought we want to look at today is the experiences of people on the earth. We are looking at certain thoughts that will lead us into the, the, the belly, the meat of our discussion. Let's examine or scrutinize the experiences of people on the earth for a minute. Now, if you look at the experiences of people on the earth, talking about the quality of life, the experience in their marriages, finances, um, education, health, every aspect of life, you will realize that um, predominantly, the earthly life experience of people who even believe in Christ is not different from that of those who don't believe in Christ. So it's common to find the very sicknesses that afflict unbelievers, the same sickness that afflict believers. The very financial challenges that the unbelievers have, the same thing with the believers. It's, it's, it's like in terms of physical experience, only a few have experiences of a kind of life that differs from the general pool. That's something to observe. Now, because of this oneness or sameness of um, experiences among unbelievers in Christ and those who believe in Christ, over the centuries and for about two millennia now, it's as though the death and the resurrection of Jesus is of no effect in people's lives in terms of experience. So all that people who say we believe in Jesus have is that we have a religion of gathering to read a certain book, worship a certain personality, expect to die one day and go to heaven, uh, or something else. But when we retire to life and go to work, the same way that the unbeliever complains, the same way that the believer complains. The same troubles of the unbeliever, the same troubles of the believer. So it's like... Life is just the same. And so the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus seem not to have made any impact in terms of physical experience of life. 
We are just analyzing some observations here in life. And this is what sometimes people talk about. Jesus is the answer. People just laugh. Because you that are saying Jesus is the answer, let's look at your life. What's the quality of your life? How much peace are you enjoying? What control do you have as circumstances? How is life for you? So it's not about us shouting loudly, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is this. <laughs> if all that we say he is does not reflect in our living on the earth, it makes sense to question whether that is really true. But then let's come to what the scriptures say. If you read John chapter 10, verse 10 carefully, he made a statement. Jesus said, the thief cometh not but to steal and kill and destroy. But I am come. I am come. That ye might have life and have it super abundantly. So Jesus was saying that the state of life in which all the goodness is stolen from mankind, the state of life in which all mankind is dying, the state of life in which all mankind is being destroyed, by his coming into life, that state was going to change. Because he was going to inject a super drug, an antidote called life to all aspects of humanity and creation to restore things to original. Now, he came actually. He walked on the earth, demonstrated that quality of life he was bringing. He was a master over luck. He multiplied bread. He was a master over spirits. He cast out demons. He was a master over diseases. He healed the sick. He was a master over death. He raised the dead and raised himself from the dead. But the father raised him from the dead. He came out of death. He was a master over the area realm. He calmed the waves. And you see, he was a master over the aquatic realm. He walked on water. He was a master over the earth realm. Name it. He lived absolutely independent of the basic principles of earthly living. Why did he live this way? To show us that there is a higher living. And that higher living, he was going to bring the world into by imparting the world with the higher life of God. Did he do that? Yes. How did he do that? He laid his life down by dying on the cross, was buried, and he was raised on the dead to prove that the life he actually came to give is a superior life. Now, anyone who receives Jesus has this life. So, how come then that the experiences of people who believe in Jesus are still largely and predominantly the same as the experiences of people who don't believe in Jesus? The one who doesn't believe in Jesus is walking in acts of sin and calling himself a sinner. The one who believes in Jesus is walking in acts of sin and calling himself a sinner. The one who doesn't believe in Jesus says that no one is righteous. The one who believes in Jesus also says that no one is righteous. And yet we know that Jesus came to solve the issue of unrighteousness. So what did Jesus do in the life of the believer? The one without Jesus is sick and afraid of disease. The one with Jesus is also sick and afraid of disease. What did the death and resurrection of Jesus accomplish? The one without Jesus struggling with economic situations, being buffeted by issues of luck here and there, with a few standing out and dominating the rest. The one who believes in Jesus is still also living in the same consciousness of luck. What did the death and resurrection of Jesus achieve? We need to ask ourselves basic questions. I've always said that. If this Bible is not true, we better put it down and look at something else. But the Bible is too true to be tested. <laughs> He says, thy word is tested, proven seven times. Jesus said in John 17, 17, thy word is truth. There's no reality anywhere. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And those of us who have dared to believe what he has left in the Bible are living proofs that Jesus indeed is a solution. If you follow carefully and listen beyond religious spectacles, but listen to the words of Jesus, you will experience a life that will amaze your own self. Back to the discussion.
actually, if you read Romans chapter 5, from verse 12 to 21, you will see an amazing comparison of life under Adam and life in Christ after he rose again from the dead. In fact, the King James translators and many other translators of the Bible were actually a bit um, <laughs> frightened by the absolute statements of the truths in the Greek. And so sometimes when it came to the Christ aspect of the comparison, they put it in the futuristic dimension. But that stretch of scripture made it so plain that one man brought sin, another man brought righteousness. One man brought condemnation, another man brought justification. One man brought death, another man brought life. <laughs> it was clear. Adam took the whole world into sin. Jesus brought the whole world out of sin. Adam took the whole world into death. Jesus brought the whole world out of death. Adam brought the whole world into uh, uh, unrighteousness. Jesus brought the whole world into justification. Death reigned unto death. Now grace reigns through righteousness unto life. What do these things all tell us? They tell us one thing. That the death and resurrection of Jesus was a dividing time in terms of experience on the earth. Humanity has been ushered, and in fact, the whole life on earth has been ushered into a new day. In fact, the labeling of timing, B.C. and A.D. is actually prophetic and insightful that Jesus was the dividing of times. Death, life. Sin, righteousness. Impurity, holiness. Poverty, wealth. Confusion direction. Are you following? It's, it's a dividing of time. But why is it that over 2,000 years of this accomplishment, he left a mighty will? Many of even those who believe in him are not different in terms of their experiences on the earth. The only thing a good number of people have it's a hope of entering heaven when they die. Is that all there is in Christ? No. Because heaven is not your ultimate place to remain. In the end, heaven will come to earth. The Bible says in Revelation that the tabernacle of God is now amongst men. And scriptures actually prove that your permanent place is not in heaven. You will come back here. That's beyond the scope of today's discussion. We are still answering one question. How come that the experiences of people who believe in Christ are largely the same as those who don't believe in Christ? The troubles, the fears, the anxiety is the same. This is it. It is simply because those who have received Jesus became something that they have not yet embraced. Oh my God. This is it. Those who have believed in Jesus became divine. But for over 2,000 years, we have still been trying to grow through the movement, through all the challenges of weaning our minds from humanity and then uh, entangled in religiosity of Christianity and still there. Having not yet embraced our divinity in him. This is the only cause. Anyone who believes in Jesus and continues to believe that he is the same person who just has secured a relationship with God Almighty through Jesus will continue to suffer the same things he was suffering. That is why it is not uncommon for somebody whose physical family had a certain case he receives Christ and he's still suffering effects of that Christ in his experience. Why? In his mind, he's still the same being. He has not embraced his divinity. Someone who is demon afflicted receives Christ and still needs help from the same demons in his experience. Why? He has not yet embraced the truth that he is now divine. Like every other thing in terms of experience, it's because we have become something that we have not yet embraced. Now let me go on a short break and when I come, I'll show you how Jesus was able to live the way he lived 
and left us that example that we can live that way by that same principle. I'll be back after this break. This book, Daddy Holy Spirit, is a classic on how to work with the Holy Spirit. Working with the Holy Ghost is very important in being relevant in this final book. And this book is to help get the Holy Spirit taught to his place in our lives as our Father and restored to the church as the Father of the church and to be able to walk with him. And everyone must have a copy. Your life will never be the same. Praise God. Right. So, what is the number one reason why you look at people's physical experiences today, mentally, spiritually, physically, and they are not different from that of unbelievers? Because those who have believed became divine and they have not yet embraced their divinity. That's what's accounting for their humanistic experiences in life. Not because the death and resurrection of Jesus is that weak and impotent. You mean Jesus' death and resurrection can sort out issues of diseases, pandemics, confusion, demonic oppressions, curses? Then that was a, the death of a goat, not the death of the Holy Son of God. I think some people don't appreciate the value of the blood that Jesus shed. Peter said, you are, not, you are not redeemed with perishable things like gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus. Let's come back to the example of Jesus. Jesus made statements that if you were there, you'd think he was a braggart. Before Abraham was, I am. He didn't even say, I was. He, he spoke as the I am. He said, ye are from beneath and from above. He said, the, our main scripture, I and my father are one. What was Jesus doing? Jesus, though physically born by Mary, he knew he was the eternal word that became flesh and he refused to be called just a human. He embraced his divinity. He thought it, spoke it, and acted it. And that was why he lived a different life. And that was the example he left us with. If we today will walk in all the fullness of that which the resurrection of Jesus brought to the world, we must embrace our union, our divinity in the Godhead, and think it, talk it, and act it, and we will have the same results. Oh boy. If you think it's a joke, try it. Try it. I've been giving you this example. Some, I think it's just been about three years. Some of you don't know what we did during the time of COVID. So when we are saying that you think it's it's a joke. Go to our website. You get some of the videos, even our Facebook page, and, and look for answer from the church. And you see those things we said. During the time of God, we made it clear that the whole world was afraid of a particle, but the church shouldn't be. Why? The church is divine. People couldn't buy it because it was too strong for them. That's how we lived. And people who had the disease, we had them and the disease left them. The same thing that was deadly to the whole world. Why were we living this life? We had, as a then, embraced our divinity. We were thinking it, talking it, and acting it. And that's what gave us those results. Wonderful people of God. Until a Christian embraces your divinity and think it, talk it, and act it, you will have the same humanistic experiences that all human beings are having. As though Jesus' death and resurrection does not have an impact on your physical life. That is why the world tries to deceive many Christians. So don't worry. You see, when a Christian wants to live the good life, it's like, hey, you are living an ungodly life. Because many have not embraced their divinity, the good life is so difficult for them. So they have postponed everything to heaven. But that is not the, If the bad life of sickness, suffering, and poverty, and all that was what it is, Jesus would have lived that way. Jesus was never beggarly. 
He didn't need houses, so he didn't have a house. He didn't need bank accounts, so he didn't have money. Are you catching it? So, a good life is not about having a, 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 a lot of money in Swiss bank and all this. Stuff. No, a good life is about having control. Everything he needed, he could call it forth. That is dominion. That is the life of those who have believed in Christ. But how can you experience that physically? Embrace your divinity. God willing, tomorrow I'll take you along that journey and show you how you can embrace your divinity. But you must first know the foundation. Yesterday, you must agree that you are divine in Christ. Why? When the human received Christ, you were imparted with the life of God. That made you a being in the class of God. If you accept that I am divine, then you can now embrace your divinity. Without embracing your divinity, your life will never be different physically. Let's pray right now. Oh, man, di kabara shoteri basata kabara. Make this confession. I say with me, I choose to transform my life by embracing my divinity in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Wow. If you have been watching us, listen, there is a bigger life. Oh my God, how loudly can we shout this anymore? Because many don't know. But Jesus brought a bigger life, a higher life, a transcendent life. It's simple. If you believe that Jesus is Lord, if you believe he is the Christ, you will be begotten of God and you will step into that life. And all you need to do is to embrace who you have become. And then you walk in it. What does it take to become a son of God? What does it take to be born of God? What does it take to have Christ in you so that you can live this life? Believe he is Lord. Believe he is the Christ. That Savior God promised to send long ago. He came into this world and died and rose again. And declare him as Lord of your life by saying this after me. Say, Jesus, I believe you are Lord. You died for the world. You were raised from the dead. I declare you Lord of my life. I am born of God. You are born of God, brother, sister. All you need to do is continue to follow this truth. Get planted in Bible teaching and practicing church. And remain in the fellowship of sons and daughters of God. And grow in Christ. Surely I'm going to come away again in our next episode. As you take a look at this subject matter from another light. Till then, life is good. Enjoy. Thank you for joining today's episode of your favorite Good Life Devotion. With Dr. David Pendant. The Good Life Devotion is proudly brought to you by friends and partners of the Final Global Movement. For more information on how to become a partner, call us on 053-444-6907 or log on to our website, finalglobalmovement.org. Become a partner today and contribute to the global spread of God's message for the now. Follow us on our various social media handles and you will be blessed. Don't miss the Good Life devotion on the channels displayed on your screen at the scheduled times. Till we come your way with the next episode of the Good Life devotion with Dr. David Bender. Life is good. Enjoy. Enjoy.